Well, good afternoon, everybody. Always a danger going after a philosopher. Um, everything I say will not sound quite as elegant or as intellectual. Um, my name is uh, Robert Lytle. I'm with EY Parthenon, obviously out of the United States. And I'm going to try to weave together a couple of the themes that we've heard today and maybe tie it also back to the role of private capital in all of this. I think we haven't had as much discussion about that today um, in the emerging competencies market. I've titled this Competencies, Technology, and Skills Delivery. We are at a digital conference, so it makes sense to talk a little bit about technology. But um, <clears throat> a lot of this really goes down to basic elements of training people to be productive in the workforce. Um, and a lot of that hasn't changed all that much over the years. What has changed in the digital era is the ability to break down and measure competencies, catalog them, match them with assessments, match them with job functions um, through HR systems and, um, and, and talent management systems. And I think that's an important push forward in the world and I'll, I'll endeavor to explain why I believe that is. Um, Everybody's talking about the skills gap. I call it the Davos, uh, the Davos flu, right? If you go to Davos or a big gathering of international CEOs, they all sit around and bemoan the skills gap that is in the workforce today. I take a bit of a skeptic's view of it. What I hear a lot is, I don't want to pay to do the training, therefore I would like the university or the K-12 system or the government to train people on my behalf. Um, you know, the, uh, the analogy there is I would love a new Ferrari. I'd like to pay $10,000 for the new Ferrari. There seems to be a lack of supply at that price point. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing. Um, skills gaps have always been there. We can go back in time and interview CEOs from the 60s or the 1660s and they tell you about the skills gaps in the workforce and the young people that are coming in today, um, even in their times. Um, but they are different. Um, you do have disruption happening. Um, you know, this is just a quick graph of uh, increase in uh, startups with AI systems or machine learning and papers being published in the same space. Um, people under the robots coming, the robots are here. Um, people who have jobs that are automatable, um, as in routine, high volume, um, are going to be displaced and displaced reasonably soon. Um, but, you know, technology moves on, the job economy changes. Um, most of us in the room had grandparents who were farmers. Um, they farmed for a living, and that part of the employment field has gone down over time. Those workers were displaced over the last 150 or so years, and workers who do uh, routine automated tasks will be displaced and actually are being displaced as we speak today. When you go out and talk to companies and CEOs, we ran a survey a couple, about two years ago, I think it was, of um, CEOs in the United States around this competencies, and trying to understand, you know, do you define them, right? Is there any there to your complaints about the lack of skills in incoming employees? And what you find is really only about half of them <clears throat> even attempt to articulate what those missing skill gaps are, right? Some of them have a formalized list, so they say these are the actual traits and attitudes that we're looking for in a potential employee. And some of them have an informal list. But half of them can't actually even articulate back to you what the skills gap is in concrete terms, right? You get very vague things. They're not prepared for work. They don't communicate well. Those are too broad. We can't actually assess and evaluate and train people on broad platitudes like that. And then when you ask them as well what the key talent ch challenges and finding talent out there, um, about half of them you know, say that their obstacle is actually finding and matching the right people. It's not necessarily about um, compensation and things like that. It's actually saying, I have a job here and I have applicants here, and my biggest challenge is figuring out how to match those two together accurately. Now, I notice that, you know, half of them they say they have a problem there, and only half of them actually bother to be able to articulate what it is they're doing. And I think those are the challenges that are starting to be answered in the workforce right now. Um, the system is responding. This is just a quick snapshot of competency-based programs in higher education institutions in the United States. Um, they are exploding. Um, if you dig into some of these, some of those are true competency-based, some of them are eh, competency in name only. Um, but, you know, this movement towards an education in the primary, secondary, and tertiary education system that breaks down and addresses very specific attributes of learning as opposed to, I've taken an econ class or a math class or a chemistry class, is, make, is, is having momentum in the, work, in, the, um, in the landscape out there. What do we mean by competencies? I think these came up earlier. I think uh, the gentleman from Facebook was talking about, you know, yeah, we need technical skills, but I also need those cognitive and those social-emotional skills, right? So having a coder 
who's very, very good at the latest coding, um, whatever that may be, Ruby, Red Rails, or HTML, is not useful if they actually don't have the thinking skills, right, the cognitive skills, and it's not helpful if they can't participate in the workforce as a productive employee, uh, have self-awareness and relationship skills and things like that. So it's this combination of things. And what's really happened recently is the ability to get down and be very, very precise in competency maps around what those skills are has taken off. Um, there's a lot of research. Right now, you have a bunch of competing frameworks. So if you walk into the technology field, you'll have co uh, co competency, competency maps that are kind of attuned to the data analytics and the coding world. And if I walk into others, I have other ones. But they're starting to converge, and that convergence is very, very important because you have to have a language, right? An HTML, if you will, of talking about competencies in order for all the parts of the system to come together. What we're seeing right now, actually, let me back up and talk about who we're trying to target with competency training out there. I think there's basically four, four big areas that it falls into. One is training progressing entry-level workers, right? A lot of those companies come down to the social emotional ones, right? So it's not necessarily skills. We've always focused on skills, vocational training and things like that, but holds back a large part of the workforce in terms of being productive and advancing in their first job is actually the social emotional skills, the ability to show up on time, to take constructive feedback and things like that. So it's a very important area there. And we now have ways to assess those skills and actually they can be trained. Um, although I was told by a psychologist once they can train those skills up to about the age of 22. So apparently at 22, you do become an old dog who can't learn a new trick. Um, the second is preparing students for the workforce. So this is taking place in primary and secondary and tertiary education. There, you're not necessarily seeing a full movement to competency, but what you are seeing is a lot of people taking a bigger piece of, um, of experiential learning um, and, and externships working in industry and blending those into the curriculum so that you can extract real learnings from them. The next is bridging isolated skills gaps. This is being done in two ways. At the upper end in kind of data science and coding, you're seeing the explosion of boot camps, which is this very temporary thing. Um, we have a job anomaly of enormous demand and nobody was taught those skills when they were 18 years old and they're now 26. Um, and it's important to realize what you have there is a group of people, the prototype of a student going through a boot camp is about 26 year old, graduate of a good university, doesn't know how to code. 10 weeks, $10,000, we teach them how to code. All the tech firms are looking for that talent. Those groups are really placement agencies that do a little bit of training on the front end. Um, and the other place you see that happening is in combinations of, in a, in a local environment, a business environment that needs a certain skill base. We'll partner up with a local government, bring in a university, and actually train the citizens in that area or import citizens in and train them to do that. You see a lot of that in advanced manufacturing and, and places like that. And the final one is the retraining of adult employees who have been displaced, right? So the prototype there is a 45 to 55 year old employee who has been automated out of a job or the job has gone overseas and they don't have the skills to continue in the workforce right now. And that has been a real pinch point. It's very difficult to actually find proof points at scale where people have been successful in retraining those adults. And it's obviously one that's going to be a, a big social issue for us going forward. If we think about what's going on in Competency 1.0, which is this kind of emergency competency networks, um, a couple of examples there. Uh, traditional university players I talked about. Um, the other one in there is that this is a place for modality and online learning. Um, the second is the coding and boot camps. Um, that has been a big private sector play, particularly in the United States. A lot of capital has been deployed there. Um, I would say that there are elements to that where they're running out of their, um, their latent pool of, of, of potential students, right? We, they've, they've gone through about six years of demand of students and now in replacement status. Um, the next one is um, HR systems. Um, HR systems play a big role in this because, you know, when you look at the talent management system, a large scale company needs to be able to say, okay, here's my job, break the job down into all of the elements. We need that common language of competencies. Then it needs to find candidates who have to have been assessed and evaluated against those competencies and match them together. And then often they'll partner with an outside person to fill the gaps um, in, in terms of, you know, you've got 80 or 90% of what we're looking for, but this is missing, I can fill the gap there. And then the final one is the job placement networks. Um, so think of the monsters and the leaked ends and the seeks of the world. 
um, who are moving strongly in this area, and they're doing the exact same thing. They're actually essentially acting like a talent management system in between, but obviously matching employees from outside of the, uh, of the business's network to the inside. As we move forward in competency 2.0, a lot of emerging frameworks, I mentioned these earlier. You've got the SFIA and the information and technology. You've got the framework for 21st century skills, which is probably the most advanced general kind of uh, education-oriented uh, competency framework. But again, the terminologies between these and the way we assess them are starting to converge. And, and that's an important piece because ultimately the assessment companies have got to be involved in this as well. And then finally, it has to all come together. Employers have got to be in there. The HR systems have to be in there. The education institutions will begrudgingly move themselves into that. I don't think universities are going to graduate you with a diploma and a giant competency map anytime soon, uh, but they will be forced to participate in that and probably be forced to at least show how their courses are breaking down against competencies or they won't be able to uh, place students in the future. Um, government and organizations and workforce, job placement boards, and the alternative training programs, i.e. the boot camps. And that's, when you look at that and think about where capital's being deployed across the um, area, it's all in these areas. Um, in universities, it's private universities, private K-12, well, mostly private universities for the uh, employability side. A lot of money going into HR systems globally um, around these types of areas. Um, and then the job, uh, the job of training camps and, uh, and boot camps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert.